what's going on? What did I miss? I remember one time laying out in the stars, just staring up at the sky and falling asleep because I was so comfortable. And the friends I was with were oohing and on about something they had seen in the sky, and I totally missed it because I fell asleep. Uh, that was the disciples on this day. We're talking about the transfiguration of Jesus today. And it's number 10 in our series. And the, this amazing moment, uh, the disciples, Luke tells us in chapter 9 of his gospel, that they were sleepy. They were falling asleep. And when they wake up, they don't miss it. Uh, it makes me feel better that the followers of Jesus fell asleep once in a while. <laughs> uh, I know people fall asleep once in a while in my teaching, and it, it makes me feel a little bit better that Jesus had the same issue, but you don't want to miss this. You don't want to miss the transfiguration of Jesus. So get a dose of caffeine in you. Uh, slap yourself around a little bit because you want to you see every moment of what we're about to talk about with the transfiguration of Jesus. So this is Luke chapter 9 starting at verse 28. We'll put it up on the screen as well. About eight days after Jesus had said this, he took Peter, James, and John with him and went up on the mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment in Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. And I'm going to read just a little bit more here from this passage. In verse 33, it says, And the men were leaving Jesus. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and enveloped them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and told no one at that time what they had seen. Now I want us to notice there's a verse right before this that I did not read. But look back. If you've got your Bibles open, look at the end, the last verse, uh, right before this in verse 27. Jesus says this, I tell you the truth that some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. Now, what does he mean by that? They will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. I think maybe a couple of things. One is that there's about to appear two individuals with him on the mountain, Moses and Elijah. Now, Moses is one of the greatest leaders of all of the people of Israel that, that the world had ever known was Moses. And at the end of Moses' life, there's this mystery surrounding the death of Moses. Nobody knows where his body was. No, it was never found. He goes up on the mountain, and he just disappears. And some of the patriarchs, their bones are buried in specific places, but not for Moses. And there's kind of a mystery surrounding this. You wonder if Moses, uh, that God, because of his unique role and God's love for Moses and his unique role in leadership, that he didn't taste death, that maybe God brought him up. Well, we don't know that for sure. Elijah, the other individual, we know this for certain. His end is recorded in Scripture, that there is a fiery chariot that swoops down, picks up Elijah, and takes him up into heaven. He does not taste death. That song, that great spiritual song, swing low, sweet chariot. That's, that comes from the story of Moses, or the story of Elijah, when he's taken up by this fiery chariot. So Jesus says this, you, some of you standing here will not taste death. And you wonder if 
Moses and Elijah represent that. That's what Jesus came to do in his death and resurrection, is take away the sting of death. His disciples would be huddled in a locked room on the night of Easter Day, that first Easter. That evening, they've heard rumors, they've heard things, and they're afraid of the Jewish leaders, so they're hiding in a locked room. And as they huddle there, Jesus appears to them, and they see his resurrected body. They knew he'd been killed. They knew he was dead. And yet there he stood before them, resurrected and whole, showing them the scars in, in his hands and the scar in his side and his feet. So some of them, I think, in, in part had experienced the, the power and the glory of the kingdom of God. They did not taste death before they experienced the power of the resurrection standing before them. There's another key part of this passage I want you to look at, and that says, as he was praying, the writer of Luke's gospel, Luke tells us that the purpose of this hike up the mountain is something that Jesus did on a regular basis. He went to a high place and a quiet place to get away from the crowds and just commune with his heavenly father. And that's his goal on this hike too. And this time he takes his three closest friends with him, Peter, James, and John, go up the mountain with him. And as Jesus is praying, they of course are falling asleep. We'll see that later uh, in the gospel account too, that they fall asleep in the garden of Gethsemane as Jesus is nearing his death. And they're falling asleep here as Jesus is communing with his father and they, they're startled awake. And as they wake up, it says, as Jesus was praying, that he is transformed, his face begins to shine. His clothes just burst like lightning with brightness and, and light. And he is transformed before them. And I think it's significant that Luke tells us it's as he was praying. Sunlight, I just, I want to be a place that, that we pray. Because as we pray, things happen. God moves. I remember on Christmas Eve, uh, right before our Christmas Eve service, I was sitting in my office and I was just praying. And I was a little bit discouraged with all the challenges we faced through COVID and the, the obstacles in the way. And I was just praying, Lord, do your work through us. Use us to be a light in this community. And as I was praying, the phone rang. And it was one of our preschool families that doesn't come to our church asking about the times of our Christmas Eve service. And I just love that as we were praying, as I was praying, that happened. Just the other day, right before our meal, as we always do, we just prayed. And one of our family members was getting tested for COVID. And, and we were just praying, Lord, keep them safe, heal them. And, and as we prayed, I got a text message on my phone that said the test came back negative. And that doesn't always happen that way when we pray. But I just want us, as we enter into this the fray of building the kingdom of God in our community, that we be a praying church. We've got a prayer walk coming up at the end of this month. Uh, and you'll hear more details about that. But I hope you'll engage and just walk your neighborhood and pray and see what God does as we pray. The next piece of this passage is that the disciples were afraid. Why are they afraid? Because, in part, because Jesus is transformed before their eyes. Now, what does it mean that Jesus is transformed? As he is praying, he is transformed. What does it mean? Well, the word here, the Greek word, is the word that where we get metamorphosis from. Metamorphi is the Greek word that's used here. And so we think of the the tadpole swimming in the water, and he transforms into this toad, right? It's an incredible transformation. We think of the caterpillar with all of his legs weaving a cocoon, and he comes out uh, a butterfly. It's that same word, metamorphosis. And we know as we've gone through this series that every event in Jesus' life is not without historical and future significance. We've already said one of the people that's going to stand with him in his transfiguration, this metamorphosis, is Moses. 
And as we think about Moses all of those years ago, hundreds and hundreds of years before, he goes up on the mountain to commune with God, and he comes back down and his face is shining. The Old Testament writer tells us that Moses' face is shining so brightly that the people are scared. <laughs> they don't know what to think of this, so that Moses literally has to wear a veil over his face in order for the people to be not so afraid to approach him. Stephen, after Jesus, this is in the future, after Jesus' death and resurrection, that Stephen is one of the first people, the first martyr, that he's put to death for telling people about the good news of Jesus Christ. And as he is dying, he is communing with his heavenly Father, and his face begins to glow. So historical and future significance as Jesus begins to shine and his face is glowing. We look back again to Moses and as when he built the tabernacle, that temporary temple for the people as they were going through the wilderness, that the glory of the Lord fills the temple. Solomon, some years later, when he is king and he builds the temple for the people in Jerusalem, and when he completes the work and he dedicates the temple, the glory of the Lord, this cloud and fire fills the temple so much so that the priests couldn't do their work, and the glory of God fills the temple. We see it in the prophets, in the writer John, in, the, in Revelation. We see Isaiah in the throne room, and the glory of God fills the temple. John sees a similar thing. He says that the, the light from God's presence is so bright that there was no need for the sun. The, the only source of light that is needed in heaven is God's presence because his light is so bright. And all throughout Scripture, the glory of God that is reserved for God's presence shines in the person of Jesus Christ right here. He is transformed. And as he is transformed, the disciples are scared. Randy Pope, in his book, The Answer, writes this. We were created with completeness, fullness, glory from God. But when, we sin, when sin entered the world, we all embark on a desperate journey to find that glory, that missing peace that we were created for, but we settle for false replacements, false glories. Randy's saying here that, that we long for the glory of God. In fact, every one of us is embarked on a journey to find that glory because that's what we were designed for, to live in the presence of the glory of God. But as we embark on the journey, in a broken and a sinful world, it's hard to find. And so we end up settling for replacements. And we get taken in by the lure of things like sexual pleasure. We get taken in our, and the dulling of our senses through alcohol or the heightening of our senses through drugs, the rush of increasing our net worth, the hope for good government, they are all pale substitutes for the glory of God. My friend John tells a story of his brother going to church after many years of leaving God behind. And when he came back to church for the first time, he was overwhelmed. And he had, to, he had to leave before the service was done. Because as he was there, he just felt this burning inside. And it overwhelmed him and it scared him and he had to leave the building. And later he realized it was his own guilt and shame and fear that made him leave the building. Because he knew who he was before a holy God and it it scared him. The pale substitutes that he had been pursuing for so many years. And then he stood in the presence of the real glory. Not a pale substitute, but the real thing in the worship of God. And it scared him to death. And he fled. I have this theory that maybe if we can practice the presence of God, if we can pursue his presence for our whole lives, and I know in a broken world that that seems out of reach, an impossible goal. But if we can possibly pursue the glory of God with all that's in us, in all the right ways, that maybe, just maybe, we won't pee our pants when we stand in the presence of the holy and the glorious God in heaven. 
time. The disciples were afraid. Now, the next thing I want to look at in this passage is that Moses and Elijah spoke with Jesus about his departure. Now, the actual word there, it's not the best translation because the actual word there is exodus. That they spoke with Jesus about his exodus. And I got to believe that for Jesus, as he knows, and the writers of the Gospels tell us, he, he knows, we've said this all along, that he's anticipating the death and resurrection. He's anticipating the suffering that is to come. Maybe he's already beginning to feel the weight of the brokenness and sin of this world. And here these two individuals, Moses and Elijah, Moses, who led the people out of bondage and out of slavery in Egypt, and Elijah, who on the mountain of Carmel had fire come down and the people were transformed by God's power and his presence, and they began to leave their idols behind and worship him again, that both of these men began to talk to Jesus about his resurrection. Maybe Moses is encouraging Jesus with a picture that, of his resurrection. He's saying, you're going to conquer death. You will rise in glory. Your resurrection will turn the course of history. Forever there will be B.C. and A.D. because of what you're going to accomplish. And maybe Elijah is encouraging Jesus with a picture of, of broken chains, the chains that bind his people. And maybe he's saying, you know, you can see even in your own disciples the chains of bondage in their lives. And the people that you lead and teach every day, you see the brokenness and the chains in their lives. You're going to break those chains. And maybe he's helping Jesus see a picture of walking out of the grave on Easter morning in the empty tomb. And another part of scripture says that he's going to leave captives in his train. That maybe as Jesus walks out on Easter morning, he, that we follow him. And our chains are falling away. Those chains of addiction, those chains of oppression, the chains of sex trafficking, the chains of corruption, the chains of violence and of shame, and the chains of depression. And Elijah is saying to Jesus, I see the chains falling away on the people that you lead as you leave the empty tomb. And what an encouragement that must have been for Jesus as Moses and Elijah talked about his exodus from the tomb. And maybe they even said things like, you know, the exodus from Egypt was a blip in history compared to what you're going to accomplish as you conquer death and sin. Because maybe Jesus in his humanity needed that encouragement at this moment. And, and his heavenly father brings these individuals to encourage him. And his heavenly father transforms him for a moment into the glorious fullness of who he is as his son. What an incredible moment that we don't want to miss the transform, transfiguration of Jesus Christ. John Stott speculates that maybe Jesus could have easily stepped right into the glory of heaven in that moment and skipped the suffering. Just as Elijah was swept up in the chariot, Jesus could have left behind his sleepy, misguided followers, but he did not. He returned to his human form, and he continued the journey to the cross. We, too, can get too fixated on suffering. We can be overwhelmed by the suffering and the brokenness of this world and forget the power of the resurrection. One of the beautiful things that these three men who are with Jesus experiences. They're overwhelmed by the glory. Even though they were made for it, to, to experience it for eternity, they're overwhelmed and they're scared by it. And this cloud comes down and then they hear God speak from the cloud and they're frightened. But when all of that disappears, what's left? Scripture says that they look up and Jesus is alone. It's, it's their friend. And not only is Jesus there and present with them, still in the midst of their brokenness and suffering and pain of this world, but he walks over to them and he touches them. The glory of God that scares the pants off us, that leaves us shuddering on the ground, groveling in the dust. The glory of God 
takes the form of the person of our dearest friend and he walks to us and he touches us. He says, it's okay. I'm still with you. That the glory of God is with us in the person of Jesus Christ. Where does that leave us? Where does the transfiguration leave us in all of this? It's interesting what God says when he speaks from the cloud. He says almost the same thing that he said at Jesus' baptism, but this time he's not talking to Jesus. In his baptism, God spoke to his son. He said, you are my son. I'm well pleased with you. I love you. Now, he says almost the same thing, but this time he's speaking to Jesus' disciples and to us. And he says, this is my son. I love him. Pay attention to what he says. Listen to what he says. How do we not listen to what Jesus did with his words, with his life, with his death and resurrection? We listen to Jesus. There's one other place that this Greek word metamorphi is used. There are a couple other places, but one significantly that I want to look at. It's from Romans 12. It says, do not be conformed, do not be shaped by this world, but be transformed, be metamorphized by the renewing of your mind. In other words, focus on Jesus Christ and it will transform who you are. We are transformed by the presence of Jesus Christ in our lives. The Holy Spirit fills us. The cloud of God's glory fills us and shines through us as his people. It is our vision here at Sunlight to know Jesus, to make him known, and to live the Jesus life. The more we enter into the life of Jesus Christ, the more we know him, the more we listen to his word, understand it, and the more we want to tell others about who he is, and the more we want to live a sacrificial, service-filled life to the world around us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for revealing your glory to us. Lord, I pray that we would practice your presence every single day so that someday when we stand in your presence, it will be familiar. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship.
say thanks for joining us again today. Be sure to like and share. Uh, give us any replies or comments or thoughts that you have as God spoke to you today as you watch the video. Hey, we're going to be changing our format in the future. We're going to be live streaming the services from the auditorium. Uh, we're hoping to do that uh, around Easter. We're going to give you more details because how you watch uh, may change a little bit and the feel of the messages may change a little bit and we hope for the better that you can experience being a part of the worship service through that live stream. Also, as I mentioned, we're going to be uh, doing a prayer walk at the end of this month, so stay tuned for details on that as well. Receive God's blessing today. May the power of Jesus Christ and his transfiguration, his glory go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors.